Okay, the next chapter in this book on sustaining the commons is the sixth chapter called Harvesting from the commons. I don't know whether that's the right English. Usually you say you harvest something. Do you harvest the crops, the forests and the fish or do you harvest from the forests? You harvest fish from the oceans, but anyway, so ocean is the common, I suppose. Okay, key concepts in this chapter, we will uh, be introduced to successful examples of governing the commons. So we look at a couple of things. Become aware of the importance of monitoring and enforcement because often the idea of sustaining the commons or governing the commons or sustainably harvesting from the commons fails if there is no monitoring and enforcement. And who monitors and who enforces and what is the role of the people who are the actors in the arena also matters in terms of trust, credibility, uh, etc. Learn about paper parks, which is a concept where you define the protected areas in the ocean, air on land, but you see poaching going on of the fish, of the corals, of uh, forests, timber or whatever else, uh, deforestation for palm oil and so on. They are called paper parks so that uh, even if they are on paper protected, in reality they are not. So they're just parks on paper, right? So harvesting from the commons, let's start with an example, rotating fish spots. Good example of how things were managed uh, in Turkey. Alanya, an inshore fishery in Turkey, experienced overfishing in the early 1970s and violence frequently erupted over competition for good fishing spots. So it was a Wild West free for all. In response, the fishers experimented with new institutional arrangements designed to enable them to recover the fish stock and solve problems related to excessive competition. So kind of a bottom-up solution. The institutions that the fishers developed are as follows. Each year in September, a list of eligible fishers is prepared consisting of all licensed fishers in Alanya. All usable fishing locations are named and listed. The stock is such that fishing in one site will not directly reduce the available fish in adjacent sites. Uh, sites. This is of course based on empirical evidence over a lo long time on how the different fishing grounds are connected but once you have number of fishers increasing and competition increasing then you will need data and monitoring to make sure this continues to be the case. At the beginning of the fishing season the eligible fishers draw lots and are assigned to one of the fishing locations. Each day thereafter each fisher moves to the next location. So initial draw doesn't matter so much because you begin to move. So in the first draw you may get the most uh, abundant fishing spot but then you will spoon have to move. Fishers are now themselves the monitors as well. Each fisher knows which spot is available for their turn for each day of the fishing season so they don't have to panic. If a fisher wants to fish on a productive spot well it's not his turn. The fisher whose turn it is will defend their right to the good spot so there are self-monitoring, self-policing and self uh, norms and punishments uh, self-designed. Hence, due to the self-monitoring of fishers, there is no incentive to cheat. Well, this is in theory. Uh, so, what's the bigger story? Let's look, the, uh, look at the introduction. In his 1968 essay, Tragedy of the Commons, Garrett Hardin, I kept saying John Hardin somewhere, it should be Garrett Hardin, argued that people are trapped in an unsolvable problem because they are unable to self-organize equitable and sustainable institutional arrangements. As we have said, what he called the commons are actually not the commons in the strictest of real definitions of commons from their origin in the UK from a long time ago. As a result, he argued, outside intervention is required to overcome the over-harvesting of what Hardin refers, referred to as the commons, what should actually be called open access resource. Remember the pasture and the sheep's example he used. The pasture was an open source so everybody could buy as many sheep as they wanted and keep grazing without 
uh, having any uh, consequences till everybody got too many sheep and tragedy of the commons happened of course although there are many examples of over harvesting of the commons this chapter will discuss success stories of self governance of common pool resources these success stories provide insights into which factors may increase the success of self governance efforts we will see that solutions to overcome the tragedy of the commons make use of the physical characteristics of the action situation remember in the very beginning we introduced the actions action situations action arenas biophysical uh, limitations actors uh, the uh, attributes of the actions uh, or actors and so on so we distinguish three types of situations in this chapter in the first type there are domesticated animals so you own them resource users in this situation must move their animals around the landscape consistent with the original example used by harden concerning sheep sharing a meadow in his a uh, now famous paper the second situation involves the harvesting of wild animals such as fish lobster or deer that move around in their on their own so there is a habitat like the ocean fresh water lake or jungle forest and you are hunting and gathering finally the third type of situation involves resources that do not move such as forests but now they are being uh, exploited to gather right domesticated animals example let's start with this one uh, i will use this one uh, as, a, as a start and then maybe stop this podcast to keep it uh, short enough or long enough torbel the switzerland torbel switzerland is a village of about 600 people located in the wispertal trench of the upper valley canton i don't know how to pronounce all these things for centuries torbel Uh, peasants have planted their privately owned plots with uh, bread grains garden vegetables fruit trees and hay for winter fodder cheese produced by a small group of herdsmen who tend uh, village uh, cattle pastured on the communally owned alpine meadows during the summer months has been an important part of the local economy let me read it again because i didn't emphasize properly cheese produced by a small group of herdsmen who tend to uh, tend the i don't know why i do that cheese produced by a small group of herdsmen who tend village cattle pastured on the communally owned alpine meadows during the summer months has been an important part of the economy cheese produced has been an important part of the economy the earliest known written legal documents are from 1224 okay a millennia millennium ago and provide information regarding the types of land tenure and transfers that have occurred in the village and the rules used by villagers to regulate five types of communally owned properties on february 1 1483 torbell residents signed articles formally establishing an association to improve the regulation of the use of the alp the forest and wastelands the law specifically forbade a foreigner fremda is the word who bought or otherwise occupied land in torbell from acquiring any right in the communal alp common lands or grazing places or permission to fell timber ownership of a piece of land did not automatically confer any communal right this is got a complicated word here genocence i'll not try it the inhabitants currently possessing land and water rights reserve the power to decide whether an outsider should be admitted to communal m- community membership this kind of situation still plays out many uh, countries including india have very specific rules about who can buy agricultural land for example you can buy an apartment you can buy land build a house etc but buying an agricultural land becomes quite complicated because you have to have a history of farming in your family you should be a native this and that and the other things right the boundaries of the commun- communally owned lands were firmly established long ago as indicated in a 1570 1507 inventory document so this is a way of keeping out outsiders coming in and then there are other issues as you know in india the the land gets 
uh, split as inheritance happens through generations and everybody is left with a tiny piece of land where agriculture becomes complicated because you know, what you can do on a contiguous land is not possible when you have pieces of land plus many kids now leave farming as a livelihood and go off and live in urban centers as uber drivers or taxi drivers rather than stay and do farming and have a um, healthier lifestyle standards of living quality of life and so on but that's a separate social issue so here is a cow in Torbell got a big bell there big belt private rights to land are well developed in Torbell and other Swiss villages most of the meadows gardens grain fields and vineyards are owned by various individuals and complex condominium type agreements are devised for the functional ownership among siblings and other relatives of barns, granaries and multi-story housing units. So this is what I mentioned about India and the splitting of land with generations. So they have made uh, you know, in mindful uh, rules to deal with that. The inheritance system uh, in Torbell ensures that all legitimate offspring share equally in the division of the private holdings of their parents and consequently access in access and consequently equal rights in access to the commons but family property is not divided until surviving siblings are relatively mature I don't know the consequences of splitting these lands in Sweden prior to a period of population growth in the 19th century and hence severe population pressure on the limited land the level of resources used was held in check by various population control measures such as late marriages high rates of celibacy long birth spacing and considerable emigration imagine that many centuries ago in the 19th century already well not many centuries ago but more than a century ago they were already dealing with population control issues to manage res shared resources the commons and overall um, farming gardening grain fields vineyards etc the swiss villagers have experienced the advantage and disadvantage advantages and disadvantages of both private and communal communal tenure systems for at least five centuries and they continue to use the communal tenure system although the yields are low the land in Torbell has maintained its productivity for many centuries so that's important in this context of sharing netting associates uh, netting the author associates five attributes to land use patterns with the differences between communal and individual land tenure so is it better if land is shared I mean split during inheritance but then it's still shared as a communal uh, rather than individual land tenure he argues that communal forms of land tenure are better suited to the problems that appropriators face when the value of production per unit of land is low so you aggregate and uh, the sum is greater than the parts the frequency of dependability of use or yield is low again the possibility of improvement or intensification of you know sustained yield intensified yield per hectare is low a large territory is needed for effective use so that as I said before individual small holdings can make a problem in terms of let's say using a tractor to mold together uh, grow a crop together on a larger land f economy of scale in terms of irrigation fertilizer use etc harvesting as well okay so a large territory is needed for effective use and finally relative la relatively large groups are required for capital intensive activities so instead of each one ha doing the sowing uh, uh, planting and harvesting on small piece of land can communal labor work together and make the uh, yield higher for everybody okay uh, of course uh, it's not always that uh, the grazing or the exploitation of the land is uh, in a fixed space and commons are shared you have um, nomadic grazers like the Gaddi shepherds with their flock in Himachal Pradesh but this is common across India also in many other countries the Bedouins for example um, I think please check on that they are nomads and they go around with their camels and other livestock so these are not landholders they go 
take their sheep and graze them on other people's lands and there are mutual understandings of why owners of land would allow the sheep to be grazed in a certain season. It's like a tractor, a natural lawnmower, for example, right? Snow and frost in the high ranges and heavy rain and heat in the low make it impossible to carry sheep farming on a tolerably large scale with success in any part of the country. The only way is to change ground with seasons, spending the winter in the forest in, low hi in the low hills, retreating in the spring before the heat up the slides uh, of the sides of the snowy range, and crossing and going behind it to avoid heavy rains in the summer. So this is how this culture has evolved over many centuries and they don't own many things because they are constantly moving from place to place. Is that more sustainable? Is that more um, in harmony with the nature and the way it's exploited versus uh, stationary land holdings and grazing? We've talked about how to manage cropping in one season and grazing in the other season, cropping during one season with ownership, grazing with common land and so on and so forth. But many issues have since evolved in terms of uh, allowing the Gaddis to uh, use land for grazing uh, etc. with uh, population growth and other factors like cash crops, uh, multiple crop rotations with irrigation and so on, these cultures begin to clash with modern agriculture then their access to grazing land becomes more and more complicated and the government didn't recognize them uh, as uh, you know having a right to graze their sheep um, on other people's land, so all kinds of other socio-economic issues, cultural issues begin to evolve. So there you have to be careful about how uh, how the sharing and grazing and land owners etc. is done through the seasons and how everybody can still manage the commons and the sh own the lands for multiple actors, multiple users uh, and so on. Okay, so let me leave this podcast here and we'll come back and look at the next example of exploiting wild animals where the stock moves and you are basically exploiting uh, fisheries, which it's not like you put seeds and grow fish. Fish have to be maintained in a different way where the exploitation is such that uh, the harvest doesn't keep declining. So we'll look at that example when we come back. Same for deer or uh, other things, okay?